John here from RipeWave Audio, and for today's video, we are doing part three of our analysis of the Onkyo TXRZ50 AV receiver. And this time, we're going to take a look at the internal amplifiers, plus other items we didn't cover in parts one or two. Now, if you missed those videos, we did cover in part one the initial setup and some basics of the room calibration. But when we got into part two, we really got in deeper with the room calibration and compared the AccuEQ experience to that of what you get with Dirac Live and both come natively with this processor for no extra cost. And we compared using the remote controller mobile app with the microphone that came with the Onkyo against using the standalone Dirac Live full application and, and UMIC-1 calibrated microphone and how those compared. So I invite you to go to look at both of those videos and see what you think there. But for this video, we're getting into those details that weren't covered in those other earlier videos. Now let's start with the remote. Now the Onkyo comes with a pretty basic remote and this is something that wasn't updated when this model line was refreshed in 2021. Uh, and I find it pretty basic. There's no backlit on this remote. Of course, there's no backlit on our Emotiva remote, but there is a backlight on Marantz remote that we have. So uh, if you like to have that feature, uh, certainly uh, in, while you're learning where all the buttons are on the remote, uh, it's certainly nice to have. But I did find that the layout of the buttons were logically laid out. And I like the fact that you could randomly get to any one of those inputs. Of course, that's what you get on the Emotiva and the Marantz remotes as well. But we didn't get that experience with on the Anthem AVM70 processor. And that was a big uh, complaint there. Some of the buttons could have been more intuitively labeled. They have some dual functions depending on what mode you're in. And that's the one complaint that we had. But it was nice that the uh, start stop button on this actually controlled our Apple TV. And uh, we didn't have to pick up the Apple TV remote as often uh, with the built in functionality on this remote. Now I will say there's a nice big display on front of the uh, Onkyo here. Uh, clearly can see the the volume and and basic connections of what mode we're in, if we're on a streaming device or, or TV, uh, that's clearly indicated. What I felt was a little small was that indicator of what mode you're in as far as sound mode, whether you're using DTS or Atmos, and uh, the indication of what speakers are active in the mix. And I found myself having going up close to the unit to see that information. Now, you might say that, well, we can get some of that information with the on-screen display, and that is true, although I found the on-screen display a little more basic than something like the Marantz Cinema 50, uh, which gives some more detailed information about what speakers is in use, but at least does tell you whether you're in a, a 7.1 or a 7.1.4 uh, type of mix, but it doesn't articulate what speakers are active necessarily uh, in that on-screen display because it's just text. And I did find the on-screen display uh, a little uh, weak in, in its graphics. It's using a, a pretty uh, jaggedy font on that and uh, compared to some of the smoother images you get uh, with, with other brands, uh, this does seem like a step backwards as far as the on-screen display. As far as the overlay you get when you're in playback mode, the displays for actually configuring the menus, the, the display for setup, etc., were actually a lot cleaner. Now, in the earlier videos, we did talk about hooking up wired uh, Ethernet, and that worked just fine. And we did find the wireless experience using the antennas that are, are built into this uh, just as easy. You, go and discover what SSIDs are out there. It does discover the available network within range very easily. You're able to put in your password if there is one. You can hit that memory button on the remote to display the password as you're typing it in. 
uh, just in case you want to make sure you're putting in the characters correctly. And this is one of those instances where the dual use of a button on the remote is a little um, cryptic, right? So why would I hit the memory button to view the password? But they do give you some prompts on the screen. Now, in an earlier video, we also upgraded the firmware uh, from what this shipped with by default. There was available update, and that worked fine over the Ethernet. Now, if you do not have networking available close by to your unit, uh, whether Wi-Fi or wired, uh, there is still an option to do uh, an update, and you can do it through USB. You can go to a regular computer, download the firmware onto the USB, and that will work just fine. Put that into the USB port and do your update that way. So they give you lots of options to do your updates. Uh, a lot more flexible than, say, my Emotiva, where everything is done through USB at this point. Now let's talk about speaker setup. Now when I compare this against the Cinema 50, there's a lot of parallels here. Both are nine channel of amplification on board. The wattage is very similar at eight ohms. Uh, the Onkyo is rated at 120 watts per channel, two channel driven versus the Marantz at 110. So they're very close as far as the reported output at two channels, 0.08%. So that is the same. They both also give a six ohm rating at one channel, 10%. Now I find that is a, a pretty weak uh, measurement, 10% total harmonic distortion, one channel driven, uh, but they do both report that. Now with the Onkyo, it's rated for 250 watts. With the Marantz, it's rated at 220. Again, very close, very similar. So these are very like units. The difference is on the cost. The Marantz is going to cost you $2,500 US versus the Onkyo. Normal price is $1,599, but it's been on sale for several months at $1,299, which is almost half the price of the Marantz Cinema 50. Uh, getting very much like speaker layouts and amplification. Now, when you go to set up with the onboard amplifiers, they give you some options. First of all, you can use by amping. They do allow that for the front uh, channels, but you do have to give up your height one power. You can't do both at the same time. So uh, if you want to by amp with this unit, you're going to have to uh, not use your height one channels. Now, with this unit, the pre-outs are always active, uh, even if you're using the amplifiers. So if you're going to buy amp this and you're going to use an external amplifier, why not just use the pre-outs uh, for either both amplifiers for bio ampling or one for your front channels internal, and maybe that's on the, the highs and mids, and one for the low channels if you're using an external amplifier for your for your low low frequency drivers. But uh, that's what the how they divide it up. Uh, you do have to give up your height one channels. Now let's talk about four ohm mode. Now we glanced over this a couple times in part one and part two. As we read more about this, what happens when you set it to four ohm mode versus six and above is it lowers the supply rails to prevent overheating. That's all it's designed to do is thermally protect the unit. It doesn't give you better sound quality or better ability to handle four ohm loads. It just puts in an additional protection uh, into that unit for overheating. Now, even without moving it to a four ohm mode, uh, there is also overdrive protection circuits independent of the setting. So if, for, if you happen to overdrive a four ohm speaker with this unit using its internal amplifiers, it's still gonna shut down and protect the amplifiers and protect the speaker. So you don't need it for that. But what it does is it limits the output voltage and the current the speakers can demand. And this is why many reviewers often say, always use the six ohm and above, because you're really not going to run a risk of hurting anything. 
and it would be very unlikely that it would go into overprotection anyways. Uh, this unit does have a fan built into it. It came on occasionally. I could barely hear it. Uh, I felt it more than I heard it. I put my hand over the, the amplifier like this and I could feel the air flowing uh, by. And this was much quieter, almost unnoticeable compared to the anthem. The anthem was very noisy. Now, in part two of my video, some people heard a noise in the background. I later found out it's probably attributed to the fan in my laptop that I'm using here to record the on-screen displays. And when that kicked on, you could hear that in the video. And so for this time around, I'm not recording the on-screen displays at the same time as recording my voice, uh, just not to have that influence the, the output. But the fan on this is much quieter than the fan on my laptop. And what was the loudest was the one in the Anthem. And I was really surprised about the Anthem because that doesn't even have internal amplifiers, and this does. So good job with the, the thermal uh, handling on this and not going overboard with the fan. The other options on this is you can use an amp for either a third zone or you can use it for your surround back right. The surround back left could be used for height two, so you have some trade-offs. Do, am I going to use a surround back? Some of you don't use it because your listening position is so far back in the room, almost touching the wall in some cases, that you're not doing surround back, but instead you're doing a second row of heights uh, because you find that's an easier way to get the speakers going. And this might be the trade-off you make is using that extra amplifier instead of for surround back for height two and zone three. There is no amp disconnect like you find in Marantz and Denon. And what the amp disconnect does is if you're going to use pre-outs, it, it shuts down the amplifier and gives you a better signal coming out your pre-outs. My feeling on this is that's good. It does help the, the performance of the Denon and Marantz. Here's the thing, when I compare the output of the Onkyo versus the Marantz Cinema 50, the Onkyo always sounds better, no matter what the conditions are. So if I use 100% external amplifiers, same amplifiers, the same speakers between Marantz and Onkyo, the Onkyo always sounds better. If I turn on Dirac Live on both of them and go through the calibration process in the same way, both with a UMIC-1, both using the same nine position measurement uh, locations, the Onkyo always sounds better. If I move to internal amplifiers, the Onkyo sounds better. If I'm listening to it in two channel mode, uh, direct, pure direct mode, the Onkyo sounds better. If I'm listening into multi-channel, now some of you are asking like, John, do some A-B comparisons in multi-channel, in Atmos, etc. How does it compare? Well, the results are the same. The Onkyo always sounds better than the Marantz Cinema 50 at half the price. No matter what the case is. This sounds very good. I'm starting to play around with the Spatial Audio Calibration Toolkit uh, Blu-ray disc. This has been a very helpful tool and uh, let you kind of see how it's performing uh, from a Dolby Atmos uh, perspective. And one of the tests that you can do with this is have an object pan around the room. And you can do this at ear level or also ear plus heights, some sort of mix in there. And what I was finding is the Onkyo compared to the Emotiva. When you just had 100% ear level speakers, the Emotiva panned and it seemed to stay at my ear level. Whereas the Onkyo, I got this impression that when it came around the front stage, it was a little higher. 
Now, it wasn't supposed to be running any of the uh, height speakers at that point, but something about the balance there, it didn't seem as true as it was panning around the room, and that was what I was experiencing. So it was an interesting test, and we're likely to do more with the spatial audio uh, calibration toolkit uh, that Joe Intel and uh, Technodad have put out, and they did an amazing job with that disc. So we'll do a review just on that. Uh, it's, it's proving to be a useful tool in my toolbox. With that said, amp disconnect. If it sounds better without the amp disconnect feature, well, that helps the Denon and Moran's products. Does it really need an amp disconnect? And maybe not. Now the question is, if Onkyo puts such circuitry into their products, it could make it even sound better. So I give it that. We got expected results when we compared the internal amps of the Onkyo to the external Emotivas. Now we have mono blocks up front, certainly a clearer presentation and more spacious when we go to the external amps. It's a subtle difference. It's something that I notice. It's something that my eight-year-old notices. Uh, whether you're, but it's a big jump in costs to go to external amplifiers of this caliber. So I do feel that this is a very good deal uh, with, with what you get in the base package. And as a receiver, you've got those channels built in, nine channels of amplification. Uh, so that's really good. Now, this is 7.1.4, so that is giving you 11. So there's two channels that you can't drive with this. If you're going to do a 7.1.4, you're still going to need at least one external amplifier, and you may as well put that on your front stage. As far as another wiring consideration is, if you do have some legacy products out there, the TXRZ50 is one of the few receivers that are still putting composite and component. So that's namely one component and two composite video inputs on the back of this. You're not getting that on the Marantz Cinema 50 or other similarly priced products. Uh, there's only one trigger output on this unit. This unit does support Bluetooth headphones, but keep in mind it can't be used with DSD playback or Chromecast or Amazon Alexa AirPlay or DTS PlayFi. So there's some limit. And I think as generally speaking, if you're doing Bluetooth in, you can't do Bluetooth out at the same time and it doesn't support it with the DSD format. And the other thing is your sound quality adjustments and listening modes can't be applied to the headphones. So you're getting it kind of straight. Now, I'm not a big fan of Bluetooth, but it is a nice, convenient thing and not having wires uh, to your headphones. So there is an application for it, but it's not the highest quality signal you can get. Now, they have this feature called Stereo Assign. This is a little bit unique where on the fly, if you're in two channel mode, you can redirect the left and right signals for the front from your front speakers to your surrounds to your surround backs, height one or height two. And we tried this, this is actually quite interesting. Uh, the applications for it may be limited, but that was kind of neat that I could move the stereo image uh, to different positions in my room. So uh, if you have a use for that on a regular basis, I'm, I'd be curious uh, to me. I just thought it was a nice little novelty item. They also have an adjustment for a digital filter, whether you want that slow or sharp or auto setting. Uh, and this is used with 44.1 kilohertz content and above sources. Let's just talk a little bit more about room calibration. Now, as we said in the other videos, you have a choice of Dirac or AccuEQ, and you can't do both at the same time. If you do have it to set to AccuEQ, you can use what they have as a manual equalizer. If you're using Dirac, then you can adjust your curves before sending that filter to the unit. But you have to stay in the application in which you acquired the data. So if you are using your uh, mobile app, which is the Onkyo 
uh, controller, then you can adjust the curves there. But if you're using the full Dirac Live application, then you have to do those adjustments there before sending it to the unit. So there's a difference. The manual equalizer is not going to be available to you if you use Dirac Live. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of you. Now they have something called re-EQ or re-EQ THX. What happens is some movies which are calibrated for uh, the, the cinema, the theaters that you go out to. And the treble is boosted for those. So if you take the exact same mix and you try to play that back in your house, the treble can seem too high or harsh. And this re-EQs that mix and lowers down the treble. Now I understand there's a lot of the movies nowadays don't have that problem. So the times you have to use the re-EQ may be uh, low. Now, when you're in AccuEQ, you also have the setting for EQ for standing waves that you can turn on or off. And uh, again, it's not available for Dirac. Dirac is doing its own thing. When you go into the crossover settings, now after running the Dirac Live calibration, it set everything to 70 hertz. I'll probably go around and, and change those because right now every speaker is cut off at 70 and I have larger towers that can go a little deeper versus my height and surround speakers. Uh, 80 is the default and the setting that THX likes. And of course, this is a THX certified unit. The only models I'll see are from Onkyo Integra. That's all we see out there today that have THX. They have this double bass option. So if you set a speaker to full range, and you can do this to any of the speakers in here, though it would be the front, the surrounds, etc., to full range. They have a double bass option. And what this is doing is not only is it sending low frequencies to your subwoofers, but it will continue to send the same low frequency to your full range speakers. So if you set your crossover to something other than full range, those low frequencies are going to your subwoofer. And uh, but if you do the double bass, it's going to both places. Now, there's also a crossover type for if you have clipped speakers and you set that and you go out to uh, the menu choice nine speaker combo. And for the brand, you select clips if you have clipped speakers. And here's where you select one of the clips models that are currently supported, like the reference premiere. And they're adding new models uh, with firmware updates. So we'll keep monitoring this. Speaker distance. Now in the manual, it says this can be either in feet or meters. But what we're finding is that uh, after running Dirac, it's in milliseconds. There's no way for me to take it out of that. It's always displaying milliseconds. Now, we all know that when you do calibration um, room distances, it's really about delays in milliseconds each speaker, so that timing that the sound is getting to your ears at the same time, even though some speakers are a little further away or more efficient or have more power driven to them and you're hearing them come to you at the same time. In the configuration menus, there are some audio settings. Included in this are the THX Loudness Plus. Uh, this will be a compensation uh, for tonal and spatial shifts when the level is reduced. So. Uh, if you're not running at reference levels of your volume and you reduce the volume, this is going to probably boost up the treble and bass to compensate uh, for those differences. But this doesn't work with Dirac. So keep that in mind that this uh, loudness plus is not uh, available with Dirac. I think this is different than in other uh, systems like the Marantz where the Dolby uh, volume control uh, can do this with Dirac uh, enabled. At least I think that's the case. They also have a speaker virtualizer that is in certain listening modes, they will simulate speakers. Now, I, I think with our full 7.1.4 configuration, there's nothing to virtualize. Uh, but if you have uh, less than that speaker count, it will fill in some of the differences. 
And then finally, they have something called Dolby Center Spread. This is something that Dolby removed for a while and brought back. Uh, this is not available for use with Atmos. What it does is it'll take, particularly with two-channel sources, and where it would normally direct a lot of the content to the center speaker, it will spread these a little wider to both the left and right channels to give that wider sound field when playing back uh, Dolby Audio uh, surround listening modes. Now they do have an option when it comes to playback. You can listen to music on one source and video from another. So what they have you do is first select your video source and then select your audio source, but it has to be an audio source without video like a CD player or a phonograph. Now, as we covered with our uh, reviews of this when it first came out, we talk about all the capabilities. It supports Spotify and AirPlay and AirPlay 2. Uh, the AirPlay comes in, the difference between AirPlay and AirPlay 2 is really the version of device you have. So if you're running iOS before 11.4 or iTunes 10.1, uh, then you're going to just use the standard AirPlay. If you have iOS 11.4 or newer, or iTunes 12.8, then it's going to use AirPlay 2. It also supports Amazon Alexa, Amazon Music, Tidal, uh, Sonos, as we said, uh, Internet Radio, as well as Spotify. You can play back of music files from USB or a music server, such as Windows Media Player 12, and then if you have a network attached storage, NAS. Those are different ways you can bring in sources with this. Now it doesn't have the Heos-like ecosystem that Den and Marantz have, but it gets some of the job done. Now, personally, I'd rather bring in my sources through something like an Apple TV or Wim MIDI or whatever. Uh, I find that these receiver or processor provided streaming capabilities, or even ones you have built into a, your ultra-high-definition Blu-ray player, are subpar to what you get for the either the user experience or for the listening experience with the more concentrated uh, type features. But they're a nice convenience thing to have. I find some of the navigation of actually trying to search and find a, a, a song not as nice as if you would get with a native app uh, from Amazon Music or Apple Music. I want to talk about playback modes, and I find these can be confusing until you really understand what they mean. You go into the manual, and there's some limited details uh, in these, uh, and I wish they gave some more explanation. They give you some basics on, on these. And the other thing I find confusing is I find myself, as I'm listening to different content, now with a wide variety of content formats now, you know, if something could come in as two-channel, it can come in as 5.1, 7.1, uh, immersive with 7.1.4, matching up the right playback modes for the source and the way you prefer to listen to something you know, it, it can take some stepping through, and I find myself just stepping through all the uh, music or all the movie different sound modes. And on your remote, you do have different buttons, one for um, movie and one for music on there. And you essentially step through them until you get to the sound mode you want. Uh, I find myself sitting there listening for a bit. Oh, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. But really understanding what each of them mean. Now, a few of them are just the pure two-channel mode, and this is regardless of whether the content is coming through as multi-channel or not. With direct and pure audio, you're going to get processing turned off. This also means that direct is turned off. Your low frequency effect is turned off. The pure audio goes a step further than the direct by turning off the display and the video. So there's going to be no video coming out to your television. You're going to see nothing on your display. It really quiets down the unit. And that's what the pure audio mode, mode does over direct. Otherwise, I believe it is the same. So when you go to stereo mode, 
you get that processing back. You get direct back. Uh, so you get your room calibration on there. Plus you get your LFE, your subwoofer. There's a mode called multi-channel. So this is going to take whatever channels are in a, on a PCM playback. That's going to be 2.1, 5.1, or 7.1 that you're going to get with a multi-channel. With DTHD, Dolby Audio True HD, you're going to get uh, up to 7.1, 96 kilohertz, 24-bit signals on that mode. For DSUR, what I understand means Dolby Surround, it expands a two-channel or a 5.1 channel input source to 5.1 or more channels. So it expands it. This is where you are, are get, making use of your speaker. So this is an up mixer with D-Sur. The Atmos, this is the standard Atmos playback. And this is giving you your positional data. And Dirac is used with that. They have a Dolby Audio. So this is the surround listening mode for, this is not up mixing, this is taking a surround sound coded Dolby source and playing it back. Then they have DTS. So you have the standard DTS and then you have a DTS IMAX. DTS Neural X is taking a 2 or a 5.1 uh, source material and up mixing it to the number of speakers you have. And of course, is the normal DTS X playback, and you then you have your uh, which is DTSX native content, which I don't see that often. We don't see streaming sources using it yet, and only a few um, Blu-rays uh, I have have that encoding. IMAX DTSX, and there's three IMAX modes. There's the standard IMAX DTS, there's IMAX DTSX, which is your immersive, and then your IMAX Neural X, which is the upmixing version. Uh, so IMAX is essentially a specialized version of DTSX. Then they have a four sound modes that ha don't support Dirac. And it seems to be their own configuration. There's one called Studio Mix, one called Theater Dimensional, or T-D, TV Logic, and Unplug. So Studio Mix is uh, there to give you a live sound or concert. Uh, theater Dimensional is a multi-channel with two or three speakers. TV Logic gives you clarity of your voices, so emphasizing the voices. Unplug is supposed to be better for acoustic mu uh, music. But I tell you, each of you are going to feel differently about these modes. Cycle through them, listening to them. You'll end up on whatever one you feel is best. I really tend to go back to the native modes as far as on this Onkyo. You know, if it's uh, Dolby Surround, I listen to Dolby Surround. If it's uh, uh, Atmos, I'm listening to Atmos. Uh, I will do the up mixing, but as far as the studio and theater dimensional, I, they sound different. They sound pleasing, but I do prefer just the standard up mixing a little better. And of course, there's the DSD mode. So it does support DSD for your Super Audio CDs and other content like that. And this is only supported with pure audio stereo and all channel stereo and mono music modes. And this gives you uh, two and five channel sources. And uh, this works. I've tried it with uh, both SACDs that I had, which were two channel or five channel, and it was working uh, well with those. So that sums up all the listening modes that we have on the Onkyo. We're very pleased with this unit, particularly at the price point that it's at. Now, there are, of course, there's some quirks here, uh, but they do give you some flexibility. While we don't like as much the Onkyo controller app, we do see that those who don't want to fiddle around as much and we just want to go straight at it, it's a useful tool and it works. If you want to tinker a little bit more, the full Dirac uh, is going to work better for you. There is this case where we do get a little hum out of our speakers when only when this unit is powered down, but our external amplifiers are still turned on. So if we turn everything off, including our external amplifiers, the hum goes away. 
or as soon as we hit that power button, the hum goes away as well. Uh, so that was one quirk that we have with the unit uh, on, on that item. Uh, we wish they could do some more with cycling through the uh, surround modes, a uh, little more clarity there. We wish they could have done more with the on-screen display, uh, pretty basic on, from that regard. Uh, the sound quality is good, and it does compare to units that are twice as expensive and sound better. And there's good internal amplifiers on this unit as well. So overall, we give this a very favorable rating on this Onkyo TXRZ50. Now certainly there's some limitations. It doesn't support Oral 3D. And for that in the Onkyo range, you have to move up to the newly announced TXRZ70, but you're going to pay a lot more for it. I think it's in the $3,000 range. So. It gives you a few other features. Uh, the unit does have an AM FM tuner. It does support moving magnet uh, phono cartridges. We didn't really cover those or even try those out ourselves, but we're assuming it will just work and work fine on, on those items. So what do you think of the TXRZ50? This will be leaving our house soon here. Uh, we feel like we covered this pretty well. Uh, there's probably things we missed, so let us know. We'll make our reviews a little better. We've got some more units coming in. Uh, we're going to do a big shootout with Denon and Marantz. I've got, we'll have four models total all going at the same time from those brands, so that should be a very exciting uh, time for us. But what do you think? Please put your uh, comments in on this model. Be sure to go back to uh, parts one and two. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you're interested, we do have our Patreon channel at www.patreon.com. And uh, as always, you can hit that one-time thanks. Uh, that's helpful. It gives a one-time donation to this channel. Helps us do things like do these in-house reviews. And you can always hit that bell notification so you're aware when the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.